role of Dave Lewis will be played today by Dave Lewis. Our apologies. All right. Thank you, everybody, for joining me. And for whatever reason, ATL Sec is bringing me back again this year, and I really appreciate that. Um, and I really appreciate you all taking the time to be here to actually listen to me prattle on. Last year, last year I was talking about barbarians at the gateway. And that was dealing a lot with uh, distributed denial of service attacks, web attacks, all those sort of things. This year I'm back for the second uh, talk in this uh, series of three that I have. And this one is about the data breaches, what happens after the attack has transpired. So for those of you who may not know me, uh, my name is Dave Lewis. I have been in this industry now for 25 years. And it pains me that I'm able to say that because I'm feeling it. Um, but one of the really cool things is when I get to go around and talk to folks at conferences, much like this one, I get to get your input, your feedback, and things to that effect when I'm here in person. And this is one of the things I absolutely love about this aspect of my job, is you can't just email folks in another part of the world and say, well, this is the way things are. It's like, yeah, that doesn't work. You have to get up close and personal. And I think we get away from that a fair bit. But over the last couple, 25 years, I have built up all sorts of interesting stories and things like that, and I've lived through some data breaches of my own. I am Canadian. I'm from Ontario, so please don't throw anything at me. We're still feeling bad about last night's loss. Leafs. Anyway, painful. So, Winnip yeah, I can get behind that. Winnipeg, all right. Um, well, you know, they've got to promote the Mooseheads into the NHL. Um, I now work for Akamai, and I'm a global security advocate there. And part of what I do is we have a lot of research and a lot of material that we go through. But that was in my talk last year. This year, what I did was, uh, for the second year in a row, I went through all the publicly available data breach notices that I could find. Now, to be entirely honest, if you're having any sort of trouble sleeping, you have to go through and realize there is no common lingua franca for data breaches. As you go through all these different data breach reports, people are like, Oh, it's a, you know, this was a data breach. A laptop was stolen out of the back of such and such's car. It's okay. It was a Windows laptop. It had a password. Um, yeah, that doesn't work. And as you're going through and reading all these reports, it's like, okay, this is a real, real problem. There is no common understanding as to what exactly a data breach is. Case in point, the Cambridge Analytica stuff. When that came out, people calling it a data breach. Others are saying it wasn't a data breach. It was a breach of trust. But that's just it. We don't have that common lingua franca. So if you ever have trouble sleeping, go through the disclosure notices. They are mind-numbing at the best of times, especially when they use things like, you know, oh, it's OK, it had a password. That's not going to do it. It is really going to drive into your brain. And when you're going through and reading these, you also run into the thing of, you know, people like to say, oh, this is the way it is. And they like to go through and they're reluctant to share information, but they were more than willing to wrap their arms around and saying, no, this is my data, this is my data over here, and there the twain shall meet. If we're not sharing this kind of information, we're not learning the lessons that are available to us from these data breaches, that's a real problem. Now, as I go through these slides, you're gonna inevitably probably see one of your companies that are in these data breach notices or in this information. This is not to make you feel bad. This is not to shame anyone. This is about learning the lessons from these issues. Now. Before I ever got into this racket, I was spending time uh, doing a degree in classical studies in archaeology. Yeah, how did I get here? Um, and as you go through it, one of the things that it really s uh, spoke to me when I look back at it was the sack of Rome in 410 AD. And this is when the Visigoths camped around the city, and the way they took over the city was they just cut them off. And slowly but surely, the city-state was taken to a point where they just flung open the doors and said, you know what, you win. And you, know, you can look at it from the ultimate data breach, and this is a real problem when you look at these things, is the attackers are always going to find new and exciting ways to get what you hold dear, be it your intellectual property, your customer user database, whatever it happens to be. And this has been going on since you know, time immemorial. And we look back a few years here. This was uh, back in 2005. There's a data breach of 40 million credit cards. Jump forward a couple more years. We see yet another one, the Heartland Payment Systems in 2009, another data breach, millions of credit cards that were exposed. There was four years difference between those. And then we flash forward to today, we're not learning the lessons that these breaches are teaching us. And this is a real problem that we have to be aware of. 
And back then, one of the early thing, interesting things was there was a simple function that was built into a lot of databases to allow database administrators to administer their data. And it was enabled publicly facing in a lot of cases. That was XP command shell. This led to so many of these data breaches, especially the two that I just mentioned. And this was never meant as a negative thing. It was actually a functionality built in there for a very positive thing. But the law of unintended consequences is a pain because it will bite you when you least expect it. If you are taking your systems, exposing them externally in ways that you were never meant to, attackers are going to be more than happy to oblige you of a rather nasty review. And flash forward today, we have things like S3 buckets. How many people here are familiar with AWS S3 buckets? Okay, good, that's more than I had in my last conference I spoke at. So these are, for those of you who are not familiar, these are data repositories on AWS where you could dump whatever you want, image files, text files, whatever it happens to be. Unfortunately, too many companies are getting breached because they're making these publicly available. In some places, not only read, but read write. This is a real problem when you consider that <clears throat> this isn't supposed to be this way. And I'll talk about that a little bit more later. And Verizon, another example here. And the thing is, none of this becomes really resonant to folks in organizations until it happens to them. Very much like you don't have a burglar alarm on your house until somebody breaks in and swipes everything. This is one of those real problems is we can't figure out how, some way to make this important to us. And data breaches are a real problem. Especially when you consider that data breaches are the current, well data rather, is the currency of the day. The amount of value that's associated with our individual uh, personal identification as well as corporate identification, there is a lot of money on the table. And when we jump back and we look at stuff like the S3 bucket thing that I was just talking about a moment ago, this is a real problem because by default, this is disabled. Let me say that again, S3 public availability of buckets is disabled by default. You have to go into the interface and manually select it so that it is available. So every time somebody says, oh, we got breached and it has to do with an S3 bucket, it's not because somebody hacked them, it's because they left the door open. This is a problem that we have to wrap our heads around. And when we do silly things like this, you have to understand this, like, this is going to bite us. And this is not incumbent upon the various groups within our organization. This is security's problem. Why? Because it's incumbent upon us to educate the rest of the organization as to the right way to do things. Those S3 buckets weren't enabled by security folks. If they were, they should be out of a job. But realistically, it was probably somebody in a development group or a marketing group or whatever it happens to be. And they just didn't understand the ramifications of what they were doing. It's not entirely their fault. Security's fault as well. It is incumbent upon us to teach those lessons. Otherwise, silly things like this are gonna happen. Oops, let me just obfuscate that. So this was something that was shared to me uh, just yesterday, uh, an individual who I'll not name because they might get upset. Um, they were at a conference, and this was a interface that was up and available on the show floor, and in that URL had the username and password and if you went into it, it was supposed to be a test system, you could actually shut down generators all over Turkey and places like that. Um, this is why I get very frustrated, because these are lessons we learned many, many moons ago, and unfortunately we had this wonderful ability to get on that treadmill and start going around and around and around and make the same mistakes over and over again. And then, things like this. Well, let me just cover those up. So here is a, um, the certificate for that individual site, if you'll notice, they were using a self-signed certificate. The certificate had expired five years ago, and that was you know, today. So this is absolutely maddening because you could affect somebody's life and limb. If this was, say, you know, oh, Halifax in the middle of a blizzard, and I could shut down the generator, I'll let you run with that one. It could end up very badly. So, in addition to the mistakes we make, we have to actually understand, too, the tools that we're using. Because a hammer is a fantastic example, and I've used this before, but I'll use it again. I can build you a house with it, or I can cause some serious grievously, grievous bodily damage. It's not the tool that's the problem. And to make that point even clearer, take it off. Take it off. So, 
you put it back on, wget is not a crime. And I know this is a very resident thing here. This is a problem that absolutely aggravated me, and you bear with me one second as I take this off because I have this wonderful new t-shirt. This is a real... Execution fail. All right, so I have now completely hamstrung myself. Yet another fail of people using tools the way you don't expect them to. But this is one of those problems, is we're talking about things, and I've seen this as well in uh, US government circles where they wanted to actually outlaw WGET because they saw it as a hacker tool. This is a real problem. We have to start doing a better job of taking our conversations beyond the security discussions here. We have to go out, we have to go to healthcare conferences, we need to go to automotive conferences. Government, if you're here from the Nova Scotia government, thank you for showing up. If you're not, please be watching this video or every other video for this conference. Uh, excellent talk, by the way, tomorrow, I believe it's three o'clock, uh, Evan will be giving a talk about that as well. And yes, I'm talking in roundabout ways. But so, tools are a real problem. Tools are one of those things where we're going through them and we're saying, we're trying to demonize these various tools. We have to understand what they are and how they work and we have to look at the criminal intent. Was there a criminal intent? No. So, when we're going through these things, that you can't, I can't help but go back to war games and think of Whopper. You know, this was a tool that was built for a certain purpose, but because there was old code in it, they were able to use it in a certain way in ways that you didn't expect that were gonna happen. Users will always use a tool you give them in ways you never imagined possible. So, this happened two years ago um, in uh, Las Vegas just before DEF CON, which was a real pain because we were trying to set up for DEF CON and all these systems are here and they were all water cooled, so we had all this wiring behind and these uh, tubes running, it was amazing. But each one of these systems was an AI system that was set up and the whole purpose of it was to hack each other. This was the DARPA Cyber Grand Challenge. All of these systems, that was their purpose, to try and break into each other. One of them got creative. This system wrote an exploit that nobody had seen before. So, right now, because we're doing silly stuff like putting passwords in URLs or making uh, XP command shell type things accessible to the outside world, the attackers don't need to go to AI. They don't need to have machine learning feeding it in. They don't need to do it because we're making it easy for them. This doesn't have to be the way. Otherwise, eventually they're gonna get to that point and I'm sure nothing could possibly go wrong. So, fake news, oh great, it had to be somebody and tree beard. Um, and as we're going through this, you have to make sure that you're in, on top of the security posture in your organization. You have to be aware as to what's going on because Brian Krebs is not your IDS system. If your stuff ends up on Krebs, you've done something very, very wrong. I myself write for various publications, but I only ever once beat him to the punch and I was really happy about that. But this, he does fantastic research. If you end up here, something's gone horribly wrong. Now this here is a screen grab from one of the Equifax portals. There was all this talk about it was a, uh, an exploit that was done. It was, you know, fairly simple. 26 different countries had a web portal with the access to the exact same data using username, admin, password admin. I'm not sure if that's exactly what it was, but it was something very simple along those lines. So an attacker is going to do the least amount of work they have to do in order to get access to your data. When we talk about things in the media, we talk about unauthorized access, insider threats, web breaches. These are things that we usually talk about in that context in the news. We don't ever talk about patching. This is one of the biggest problems. When I went through the data breaches for 2016 and 2017, I'm still going through those actually, a lot of them were because there was a missing patch or configuration error. These were problems that didn't have to exist. So we're looking at, for example, Mark Nunikoven just gave a great talk just before I came on stage where he was talking about old deprecated libraries, 10 year old libraries that were being used in systems. Why do we keep making these same mistakes? I'll give you an example. We are making these mistakes because we have to do a better job to communicate beyond our own sphere of influence. We need to take this conversation to a much wider audience. Because threats are everywhere. Wake up, jerky. There he goes. <laughs> Told you I'd call you out. So one of the things I saw recently, um, actually about a year ago, that I really enjoyed was the best um, data breach movie I've seen in years. Oh, you want a picture? There you go. There you go, you made it. 
Every year I have to call him out. This is the first time he's actually in the room. So one of the great things that I saw was uh, the Star Wars movie Rogue One. If you haven't seen this movie, I'm sorry, I'm going to spoil a couple of things as we go through here. But it was really interesting because around this, the, this uh, citadel where they store all their data, they had the firewall admin. So the firewall admin there, he's trying to do his job. And then along come these rebels and they're saying, no, no, we're okay, we're legit. So there was a failed authorization at authentication at first because they weren't expected. They weren't supposed to be there. And he's like, okay, well, no, really, we are actually who we say we are. We had to redirect, stop for coffee, that sort of thing. And they're like, okay, we'll send your code. Sure. Yeah, so send the code, pop that system, and oh, yep, they're in. So this is one of the things I really got a kick out of because all of a sudden they're into the system. And this is an example of so many organizations don't know they've been attacked. They don't know they've been breached until far too late. And this happens all the time. And this is not to beat up on Deloitte, this is just an example. So many companies run afoul of this that they find out far too late. And once the attackers are in your system, they want to escalate their privilege because they want to get away with as much as possible. And remember what I was talking about how it would be a case of a long period of time before anybody noticed. I've seen different reports from 100 to 250 days, depending on who you're listening to. Um, if it's more than two days, you have a serious problem. The thing is, they don't usually see what the indicators of compromise are until it's too late. In this particular movie, the commander's sitting there and he's seeing all these explosions around the base, and he's like, is somebody gonna do something? And they go, oh, right, yeah, this is bad. Okay, that's one of those things. But by that point, the damage is already done. The attackers are in your system. They have got their hands on the data they want to exfiltrate, and off it goes. The eager of filtering begins. They're sending it out to their friends on the outside. And away it goes. What is the best lesson from this movie? Encrypt your data. So they got in there, they got the plans for the Death Star, they were able to send them out, but all of this was easily open, no encryption whatsoever. When you are trying to take over the entire universe, I would hope you would encrypt your data. Uh, but yeah, so when we scroll back and we look at the different types of things, the different types of breaches, back in 2012, uh, on my own site, liquidmatrix.org, I started tracking data breaches. This was back in 2012. So if we look here, we see some of these, um, these records that are up here on the, uh, that's not gonna work there. Uh, so Yahoo, 453,000 records, uh, <coughs> apparently. Um, and that escalated from there, where LinkedIn, at the time, was 6.4, or almost 6.5 million records. That was huge back then. Now it's a just absolute road bump. Nobody even would blink at that point. And this is one of those things where we had indicators of compromise. We had issues that we knew were coming, but we didn't really do much about it. And I'm perfectly guilty of this. I was working at a company, and if you can see the top bar, you can figure out where it was. This was a very public data breach. This was one of our systems that were publicly facing and ended up on the front page of every newspaper. And the reason I found out about it is because the phone started ringing first thing in the morning. And they're like, yeah, it's such and such from CBC. Oh, it's such and such from Globe and Mail. What? This is how we found out. Because this was a system that was a little marketing system that was off by itself, was not thankfully not tied into any back-end system. And attackers, the root beer sec crew, were able to take it over and pop that system because it was a deprecated version of WordPress. The problem here wasn't that the marketing team hadn't taken it offline when we asked them to take it down. The problem was that as a security team, we didn't go back and verify with them that it had been taken offline. So that was one of those cases where you take the sword tip, put it in your chest, and lean forward. And that was a horrible lesson to learn. And you have to realize that stuff like that is going to happen all the time. Now, at Akamai, one of the things that we do is we do this quarterly report called the State of the Internet Report. We go through it, and every single quarter, the number one attack type that they're using, the attackers are using, is SQL injection. Why? Because it still works. My running joke is how long has SQL injection been on the OS top 10? The best answer I've ever had was from the beginning. It, it literally has been that long, and still, here we go. And the thing is, just because something seems like a good idea doesn't mean it is. So there was a social media platform, which I don't even know if it's still around, called Yo. This was a bet between a couple of programmers. They said, we can write this social media app in a day. And they literally wrote it in about eight hours. They were online, but they factored a zero into the security posture of it, and they got compromised in very, very short space of time. 
the whole premise of this was you could go back and for your friends just saying, yo, that was the sum total of it. How they thought they were going to monetize that, I don't know. SQL injection, we have to sanitize our inputs, we have to sanitize our outputs. These are things that we can do now to limit this, because the attackers are making use of it when we're not protecting our systems. Just some of the examples that have popped up over the years. This isn't going away anytime soon. Now, there's a great site which I always love to use called informationsbeautiful.net. They do data visualizations for basically any type of data set you can imagine. And here, I've shown this one before, this is a visualization of data breaches. Really, really cool. This is about a year and a bit ago. Then I did one from a few days ago. We need to learn this lesson, otherwise it's gonna get worse. Imagine being a customer of an organization that you don't want to be a customer of and all of a sudden all your information is just hanging out in the breeze. Canada, United States, United Kingdom, who knows how many other places were affected. This is one of those things. And it really feels sometimes like with data breaches, everybody wants one. That's not the case, obviously, but we need to do a much better job. Because if we're not using the right kind of security controls, eh, you're gonna get limited return on your investment. And as Mark was saying earlier, Wanna cry. This is a problem that never should have happened. Literally could have been fixed about 10 years ago. And in many cases was. But unfortunately we have this wonderful bad habit of re reintroducing old code or using stuff that is inherently broken. So when you're looking at doing data breach in, uh, uh, recovery, you have to look at what's the cost of that incident is gonna be for your organization. How much is it gonna cost to remediate the finding? One company I worked at years ago, we had a penetration test done. The, the penetration testers just completely owned us. It was unbelievable. And the cost to fix everything was staggering because there had been this amazing amount of security debt that had been built up over the course of a decade. This is one of those things. What kind of security debt are you carrying in your organization today? Missing patches, old accounts, things like that. In the same organization, we had somebody with administrative access that had left the company roughly almost 10 years pr prior to this uh, test and had also since passed away, but his account was still active. This is one of those things, this does not have to be this way. So we learn valuable lessons by <laughs> falling on swords and hopefully you can learn from my mistakes as well as the errors that we suffered. And you also have to look at how are you gonna communicate this to the outside world? So for example, with that one system where root beer sec took us out, we didn't get ahead of the narrative. The narrative got ahead of us. And the stories that were spinning up in the media were something else because we had not properly managed this to the outward stakeholders. We had not managed it internally well to the internal stakeholders. And that's one of those things, it's like how are you going to expense it? External PR, internal PR, crisis communications. How are you gonna to talk to the customers about what happened? You also have to look at potential legal fees. Canada is not quite as litigious as the United States, but that could easily happen if your organization is bridging both, or conversely, it's egregious enough that in Canada you get nailed. This could have a real significant cost. And compliance penalties as well. GDPR, which I'll mention a little bit, is coming up. That's gonna have some serious, serious consequences if people are not taking the accountability of the data that they have in their purview seriously. Also some other costs, loss of revenue is always a possibility customer attrition, and the stock valuation. So one real good example is a company I worked at a long, long time ago. We had the CEO uh, send out a rather unfortunate email to the entire organization with a banner at the bottom, internal use only, do not send, top secret, blah, blah, blah. 27 people sent that email out to external sources in the first minute. One of them worked for the press. Stock valuation dropped 20% in one day simply because of that information. The nature of the information is really not important, but that's just it. The impact of things like that, if you don't have proper controls in place, this is what can happen. And we had not properly educated the C-suite as to, well, actually that's not true. We had a properly educated C-suite, they just forgot to mention to us that that email was coming out. So, real, real problem in that regard. And the cost of the data breaches are something else. So, for example, Verizon, when they were looking to buy uh, Yahoo, they knocked $350 million off the purchase price because of the uh, data breaches that they had not previously disclosed. TalkTalk, Talk, which is a uh, provider in the uh, mobile provider in the UK, weren't encrypting data. 
and I believe it was their CEO or the, C or the CISO, I can't remember which one, they came out and publicly said, well, why do we need to encrypt the data? Nobody said we had to. Bit of a problem. So that led to a breach of roughly 157,000 customers and also to the tune of 400,000 pounds of a penalty which may not seem like that much, but this is just going to continue to grow, especially when we take into account things like this, where Yahoo, the SEC fined them $35 million in the last couple days because they had not disclosed this information. So when you have a data breach, well, you have to make sure you're actually communicating it properly or in the event that you haven't had one yet and you are making sure that you're taking the time to properly secure the data. And also ask yourself that valuable question, do you need this data? Case in point. This is an app for a conference that I attended not too long ago, and of course, me being me, I re, uh, took it apart, and two of the commands there, read, write, external storage, and there was all kinds of other things here. It was asking for information that it did not need to have, and some of the things that I found in this app, that if this app was available after May 25th of this year, this would be a real problem, because GDPR. And people like to go, ooh, Boogeyman, GDPR, it's, no, it's only a UK, th or EU thing, sorry. Um, it has ripple effects across the entire industry. We have to be aware of this. And I can't stand here and say, you gotta get ready, uh, you have less than a month, so if you're not ready now, um, yeah, it's gonna get ugly. So, the other side of it is, you wanna look at and make sure your internal folks are doing the right thing. So somebody did this really interesting graph where they actually meant, had a look at the Equifax breach. The hack was discovered at this point, and then there's massive insider trading here and then the disclosure. I really hope somebody is going to get in trouble for that, but that remains to be seen if that's actually gonna to come to pass. So, okay, so who got the pink slip in the Equifax breach? And this is really salient to any organization that suffers a data breach. Who's gonna get the door? So for this organization, the CISO retired, the CIO retired, and the CEO, did anybody guess? Actually, not too far off that. $90 million he walked away with. 90 million. The CISO made 11 million in four years. If my boss is watching, I need a raise. Um, <laughs> and this is one of those things where you're looking at these things and this, imagine that happened to your organization where your entire C-suite took a haircut right away. Uh, that wasn't the entire thing, but it's one of those things where you're like, oh, okay, this is a real problem. And people say, oh, well, you know, it's just that one organization, but the next day, this happened. TransUnion was serving up. Oh, we need you to update your software. They were popped, and they were serving up um, backdoored versions of Flash. Ugh, real problem. So when you're going through these things and you're looking at all these different things that can go wrong, you wanna make sure you're working with the proper stakeholders internal to your organization. The compliance team is a great example. I can't believe these words come out of my mouth sometimes, but no, that's true. Um, I have worked with compliance organizations in the past where it was very much an adversarial relationship, and over time I went, wait a second, I need to flip this around. This is something where I can get a lot more value for this if I'm working with them. So if you're working with your, uh, with your compliance team, they can help you go through and look at all of your documentation, make sure that you are actually properly vetting it against all the different types of uh, legislation that's out there. They can be a huge ally because a lot of times they're the adult in the room when you're having discussions. So when we're talking about these sort of things, you have to look also, and when you're talking about data breach type stuff, you wanna go back and look at the things where things can go horribly wrong, but you may have had the right intentions. And this happens far too often. So back in the 90s, this was a great example of, I got angry. I was working for a company who shall remain nameless, and we had somebody that was attacking our client, and I got mad, and I hit them back. So I breached their systems, I left a little note for them, I said, please stop doing that, also these are the things that are broken on your system. And they found that note, and they found the burner email address that I left there, and they sent me a note a couple days later. Well, they were very appreciative of all the things that I pointed out, and they were appreciative of the fact that I didn't break anything. They also wanted to point out that I was the wrong target. I had actually gotten one of the octets wrong, and I had hit back at the wrong thing. So when you see legislation popping up of, you know, okay, how you're gonna deal with your attackers, how you're gonna deal with protecting against data breaches, and they say, oh, hack back. This can go so horribly wrong, and I'm living a proof of that. Thankfully, it didn't go badly for me, uh, but that was just blind luck. 
And it's not only myself. One example, I had an external uh, provider come in and say, okay, look, we're gonna do a vulnerability scan of your entire organization so you can give it asset inventory as well as make a cursory exam as to what it is, so you can see how our product works. And I was like, okay, great, that's fantastic. Free? Yes, free. Okay, great. They did the scan, I gave them my class B, and they said, class B? I said, yes, we're a power company, we have, that's how we operate. And they said, sure, okay. Did the scan, came back, nice thick report, started flipping through it. I'm like, Shenzhen, Beijing. But it, this isn't right, and I went and I looked. They had made the exact same mistake that I had made years previous. They had put the wrong block, or wrong, one wrong octet, and they ended up scanning a huge swath of Chinese IP address space. But the really interesting thing, there's roughly about 300 different printers that were openly exposed to the internet, which was really interesting. But this is one of those things, it's like mistakes happen all the time, and the law of unintended consequences is such that it's going to happen at some point. You need to be properly prepared for these sort of things. And you also have to make sure that you're doing a better job of educating the individual groups within your organization because they are gonna be your best allies if they are properly equipped and educated to do so. So one organization I was working at, we had a, uh, it was a power company, we had this one app that went live before it ever got vetted by security. So I said, all right, fine, I'm gonna have a look at it before too many people know it's there. I did what I would normally do with any sort of web app. I did view source, that was the first thing I did. That, that right there, and just make sure. View source, this is what I did. What did I find? Commented out in the code, username admin, Password, password. This was the administrative credentials to log into the administrative app, uh, interface for this application. The URL for which was also commented out in the code. The exact reaction that I got for the head of the uh, particular app team that put this app together was this. He said I hacked their system. Does this sound familiar? This is one of those things. We have to do a better job of educating folks to make sure that they understand what they're talking about, because otherwise you end up feeling like me all the time. Not that that's me, it's just a much better looking version. But the best thing was, is when we went through all of this exercise, I realized it wasn't their fault so much as it was mine and my team. We hadn't, well, we hadn't known about the application until after it went live, but we had to do that, sit down and educate them on what the good things were to do when you're doing app development from a security perspective because otherwise you end up like this, and you don't want this to happen. You wanna make sure that you're helping others because otherwise things are gonna happen that are very wrong. One organization that I worked at a long time ago, we had this battle internally of don't do X with this particular server, and they fixed it, and no problem. I left the company. Two weeks after I left the company, a coworker sent me an email and said, you're not gonna believe this, and put the URL in the email. So I don't know if you can see it, but in the top of the URL, the arguments that are passed are slash Etsy slash password. And it dumped the entire password file for that particular server. Two weeks after I left, after we had already fixed it, they ended up reverting the changes that we had put in. Because users are gonna do really weird and interesting things. And they're gonna ask for things that you go, wait, why are you asking for that? Because it may look neat, but this doesn't tell you anything. Thankfully, that company doesn't exist anymore. And mistakes can happen everywhere. They can happen with security companies. The first time I gave this talk, roughly about two hours before I went on stage, this happened to this company, yourdataissecure.com. I felt really bad for them, but we, I never did find out what exactly happened, but their entire database was dumped and available on their own website. So I think something went very, very wrong that day. And when you go through a data breach, it really feels like you are personally violated. And Bob Lord, who I've had the fortune um, to know him for many years, I went through and he said exactly this, it feels like you have vertigo. And when I went through my own data breach, it was that, you just couldn't sleep properly for a couple of days because it becomes very personal. And that's just it, when I was talking about it earlier, you need to have that, make that personal somehow. Somehow you have to make that in such a way that resonates with you, resonates with your organization and beyond because this is how we're gonna learn because mistakes are gonna happen. Morris Worm, great example. This was a mistake that happened. This worm got out, caused all kinds of damage, but that was never the, user, the, the original author's intent. This is just what went down. Now, as a result of all this adversarial relationship that we tend to build as security practitioners, we often see ourselves as this person. 
running through the halls of doom, battling all the various different groups, battling all the uh, different attackers online, this is something we need to move away from. We need to stop aligning against ourselves and being an army of one. We need to make sure that we're engaging other stakeholders within our organization because this is how we're gonna do a much better job of things. Internal audit. Do we have any internal, uh, any auditors in the room? Nobody's willing to admit it, okay. I have done that in the past, so there, I'll, I'll be the one to fall on that sword. Internal audit in the past, much like compliance, for me was an adversary. And again, that was an example of I was doing it wrong. I was able to actually leverage these folks to do a better job in my own security practice because they could help by testing our re incident response plan. This was a great sounding board. They could actually help quantify the risks that we're dealing with in the environment. So when you're talking to senior management, you don't go, oh, we have this horrible vulnerability in X. You want to actually sit down and talk to them about, oh, what is the actual risk to the organization? You need to be able to quantify it in ways that they're going to understand because if you can't speak knowledgeably to the C-suite in ways they're going to understand, you're not going to get the funding. You're not going to get the traction that you so desire. You want to make sure that you have a good communication and plan in place. I was talking about that earlier. If you don't have something sound in place, this is going to go badly because the narrative will take on a life like you never imagined. Crisis communications is a great example. Something goes wrong, you want to make sure that you communicate in an expeditious fashion, but you also want to make sure that when you're doing so, you're doing so in a clear and coherent fashion and you have a game plan that you stick to and that you've tested before everything went sideways. And it's not the zero day that's gonna kill you, it's usually the 100 day vulnerability. And that's usually the patch that hasn't been applied forever. Well, in this case, 100 days. But, um, and this is what I like to refer to as security debt. And I worked in an organization in the past where we had a database administrator who had not applied the Oracle patch for three years. And so they have a regular patch cycle. Three years, this was a real problem. And I asked them why, that was the issue, and they said, well, because it's, you know, I want to make sure it's my data. And I'm like, no, 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 that's not how this actually goes down. So you need to start where you are. You need to go through and make sure that you are looking at the issues you have in your organization. Do you have a risk register? Do you actually know what's on fire? Or are you running around with your hair on fire? Firefighting all the time. How many times can I say fire? There's four. Um, and that's one of those things. You need to start somewhere. There is no easy way to do this, but you have to roll up your sleeves and make sure you're doing this in an iterative process. Because security utopia isn't going to happen, but you can make incremental changes to improve things. You wanna make sure that you have a clear and concise pattern to patching. Patching is not as easy as just patch it. I spent nine years in control systems, that just doesn't happen. Um, when you have a system that's been in the field for 35 years and they say, oh, just apply the patch, and it hasn't been updated in 35 years, yeah, guess what? It's not gonna go the way you think. So you wanna make sure you have some sort of plan. You wanna make sure that you can demonstrate when external auditors come in, that you can show to them how things are going. You wanna stop threats earlier in the iterative cycle. You wanna make sure you're looking. Are, how many people here look at the DNS leaving their organization? GRE, leaving their, there's one, all right, good. <laughs> are you looking at GRE tunnels that may be going out of your organization? Another thing to keep in mind, but these are the things you want to make sure of because bad actors are using things very much the way users are in ways you never expected because they work. And when people tell you you need to innovate, you have to realize that, yeah, you can't build the plane when it's already left the ground, but you can scramble to make sure you're tackling it. And you got to learn how to let go. I was uh, managing an IDS system in one organization where it was multiple servers over various different geographic locations. I wouldn't let anybody touch it. This is a real problem. I wouldn't let anybody touch it. And I learned to let go when my mentor said, you know, this is the only way you're gonna get um, ahead. And I went, okay, all right. And eventually let it go and they had to hire two more people to do the job. And you have to understand that when you let go of these things, you can work on other stuff. There is never going to be a case where you're like, as a security practitioner, I have nothing to do. If you've met that nirvana, go open a coffee shop, you're done. And this one last story that I'll share here, um, was a case where I was working in one organization, the users in our uh, office in Southeast Asia had figured out a way around the firewall. So they were downloading all kinds of cracked movies. 
Another example, I was working for another power company. We found a Cisco 1750 under the floor that was communicating with a company that used to be part of our company, which was now a competitor. These are the things you have to constantly be looking for, and it's not easy, but it is achievable if you're making incremental changes to your organization in a positive way. That being said, I'm at full time. I would like to say thank you to all of you. I would like to thank uh, APLSEC for having me back yet again. And if you want to say hi to me, uh, drop me a line, Dave at Akamai.com, or conversely, you can get me ranting and raving on Twitter about coffee and various other things. And that being said, thank you very much. <laughs>